Welcome to another episode of The Rest is Politics with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. And Alistair, I can share with the world, is wearing a very fetching blue shirt. <laughs> Royal blue shirt. <laughs> Royal blue. Ah, yes. I wonder whether that's because I dressed in the dark this morning before I went for my very early swim. Now, we're going to talk about the COVID inquiry, which I think is becoming very, very interesting in its early stages, even as it sets out as Baroness Hallett sets out what she wants to do with it. We're going to talk about China, and particularly China relations with the United States. And I think if we've got time, we want to talk about Kosovo, what's happening there at the moment, which is alarming, but I will argue not as alarming as maybe some people are trying to suggest. And also Poland, where uh, we're recording on Monday, and yesterday half a million people, it seems, turned out to protest against a plan, what is being perceived as a plan by the government to stop Donald Tusk from being uh, a candidate in the upcoming election. So does that sound okay? It sounds very good. Well, let's start start off maybe with COVID inquiry and what's yeah. been interesting you and troubling you around this. Very quick explainer for people on this, Baroness Hallett, retired appeal court judge, wonderful Desert Island Discs to listen to if people want to learn more about Baroness Hallett. Her father started as a beat cop and then rose out to be a very senior policeman. But over to you on on what she's doing with the COVID inquiry. Well, she says that she's going to, as it were, cliche time, leave no stone unturned. And it would seem from the approach that she's taking thus far that that's going to be the case. So she's got several different investigations going on and she's calling them modules. So the first one is about pandemic preparedness and resilience. The second is about core political and administrative decision-making in the UK and the devolved administrations. And the third is the impact of the pandemic on healthcare systems. And looking at the questions that we... What was interesting about... I, I do recommend that people take a look at the inquiry website because they seem to be adopting the approach of as they develop ideas, as they develop their thinking, they're putting quite a lot of, a lot of stuff out there. And we'll come on to the whole sort of row about WhatsApp messages and so forth. But in terms of what has ended up already in court and this ridiculous situation of the government taking the government to court over its own inquiry, she's clear that she wants to see all unredacted messages sent and received by Johnson between the 1st of January 2020 and the 24th of February 2022. Johnson's unredacted diaries unredacted. There are 24 notebooks, apparently, that he was using at the time that she also wants to see. She's also named a few advisors and also Rishi Sunak, Matt Hancock, Les Truss, Professor Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer, Patrick Valance, Dominic Cummings. She's asked for witness statements, as you would expect. And when you look at some of the questions that she's, we're, we're, we're already seeing some of the key questions as she sees it for Boris Johnson. And if I were him, I would be having a quite a sphincter twitch, I think. This one, for example, notwithstanding that the Department for Health and Social Care was the lead government department, why did you not attend any COBRA meetings in relation to COVID-19 prior to March 2, 2020, given the seriousness of the emergency? Were, were you advised or requested to attend any previous meetings on 24 January, 29 January, 4 February, 12 February, 18 February? What effect, if any, do you consider your non-attendance at those meetings had on the extent to which COVID-19 was viewed as a serious threat? And then this one. Why did you attend a personal social meeting on the evening of March 19 after you had called on the UK on March 16 to stop all non-essential contact with others? And it turns out that this meeting was with the evening standard proprietor, Evgeny Lebedev, whose father is currently under sanctions from several countries, but not the UK. Um, so that's all quite interesting. She asks him specifically about alleged breaches of social restriction and lockdown rules by ministers and what effect they might have had on the confidence of the public. She asks about the role of special advisors. She asks about the relations with the chief medical advisor. She asks about the relations with cabinet ministers. She asks about preparedness. And she also asks him some very pointed questions about when he learnt certain things. Anyway, and of course, there's the whole sort of devolution and relations with Scotland, etc. So, it's going to be very interesting. A couple of things that strike me. One of them is these inquiries in general and what makes for a good inquiry, useful inquiry, and what doesn't. So, I guess the two that were relevant to you were 
the Butler inquiry and the Chilcot inquiry in relation to Iraq, I guess, were the two that you engaged with in most of it. Well, the, 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 Hutton, the Hutton inquiry was probably more personal, yeah. And what's your sense of what made for, when you were on the receiving end of this, what made for a good inquiry, what made for a bad inquiry, what it takes for an inquiry to have public confidence or not? I, I mean, the, the Butler inquiry was a little bit different because, I mean, I, th I think because you know because he was very much a creature of government, having been the right. cabinet secretary and so forth. But Lord Hutton and and, and Chilcot, although he had also been a, a civil servant, his inquiry was I think was was the official Iraq inquiry, much bigger, much wider reaching. I think what makes them is an absolute determination to get to the facts on everything. And that does mean being very, very rigorous. And I think that it, I, I quite like the fact that Baroness Hallett seems to be so determined to get to the bottom of, of all these different messages. Because I'll tell you what I think is interesting. The government's case is that they shouldn't be expected to hand over lots of messages unless they're unambiguously relevant to COVID. But I think her point would be and, and I, I had to endure this with, in relation to my diaries in the Hutton inquiry. I was not allowed to decide what was unambiguously relevant. A lawyer had to do that. Well, the, and, and I think, sorry, to come in on this, I think the same is true in this case. Uh, it's the government lawyers who are deciding what's relevant and what's not. It's not the individual in possession of the diary. Which is fine up to a point. But I think that for, for the judge, particularly as what happened back in the, you know, when we were in, in government, even though texting existed and so forth, there does seem to have been this sort of, this move towards government by WhatsApp, where these groups are set up and that it seems is how decisions are being made. Now, I think she's perfectly entitled to say, for example, let's just imagine a situation, those questions that she asked about why Johnson didn't attend certain COBRA meetings, okay? I think she's entitled given that he seems to spend most of his life on an insecure phone, she is entitled to see to whom he is talking about what. If, for example, it emerges that a third of his messages around that time were actually about this mysterious book deal that he was doing to write a book about Shakespeare, I think that would be relevant, even though it's got nothing to do with COVID. The relevance is the fact it shows the priorities. So I guess the, I guess the, the, the point is this, that you didn't hand over fully unredacted stuff, did you? you a lawyer decided what was relevant and what wasn't. So yeah. the, the big story here is that she's asking for something completely unprecedented. She's asking for something that goes well beyond what the Hutton report, the Butler report, the Chilcot inquiry was doing. And so the government is, for better or for worse, and I'd probably argue for better, trying to get a clear legal ruling because the precedent set around this is incredibly important for the way that you do government. And they're trying to, I think, defend an important principle, which is that governments need to be able to correspond with each other without fearing that every single thing they say every off-color joke, every reference to football is going to find its way into the public domain. Otherwise, basically, you, you don't have any government. I mean, if, if every single meeting and every conversation you have is happening in public, you kill a lot of what makes, uh, unfortunately, I mean, I can try to illustrate this, but you'll know this from your own life. I mean, conversations have to be able to take place in private. And if every conversation you're having is taking place in the blaze of a media spotlight, it's very, very difficult to admit uncertainty, say that you're wrong, express any humility, ask stupid questions, or do any of the things you need to do. But all that is possible. All that, all that was possible at any time. What I think I sense she may be trying to establish here, I don't know, is that the nature of the means by which we were being governed at the time was not serious government. Now, I don't know that. But for example, what you what, what you just said there now, I mean, I, I looked up the guidance on government communications. And this is this has been updated because of new systems of communication, such as WhatsApp. Government communications belong to the crown and must be handled lawfully. If you hold such communications, you do so on behalf of your department. Now, of course, you can have the idea that this judge is going to sort of take an exchange between Boris Johnson and his wife about their kids or something like that and put that into the public domain, I think is absurd. Every single person who is working at senior level on the inquiry is cleared to a pretty high security level. But Alison, let, let, me, let me challenge here. Let's go back to your own experience with the Iraq inquiries. 
you didn't simply say, we trust these inquiries and we're handing everything over to them unredacted. You had lawyers go through and decide what was relevant or not before it was handed over. And they, and they, and wait a minute, no, wait a minute, and they, no, wait a minute, and they had discussions with the inquiry as to what was relevant. The the same is true here. Right, and that can happen now. But but the reason the government's seeking judicial review is she's requesting something that goes well beyond what's ever happened in any inquiry in the past. She's essentially saying she's not going to get into a conversation about what's relevant or what isn't. She wants to see everything. She's basically saying that at the the height of a national crisis, everything that the senior people who are meant to be in charge of that crisis do and say may be relevant to her inquiry. Yeah, exactly. And that's what's being, and, and that's, that's what's being challenged. So that's exactly what's being challenged. So they could have said the same to you over Iraq. They, they could have said to you over Iraq, every single thing you did on any policy area, anything to do with your personal life was relevant to the Iraq inquiry and you needed to hand it all over. But that wasn't what happened. The tradition in British government is that the lawyers discuss with the inquiry and then they go through and decide what's relevant and what isn't. It's a hugely different situation if you say they have a right to see everything and they will decide what's relevant and what isn't. Well, I just think that you have to wonder about the motivation. If that had happened, if that had happened with me, I would have felt two things. One, I would have felt that's a bit over the top, but I'd have had to go along with it just as I had to go along with the process that I did. You wouldn't have had to go along with it. Your lawyers, the cabinet office lawyers, would have resisted. Well, they might. No, they would have. No, I, I, my, no, my, no. My, well, okay. My no, suspicion tell, no, no, is no, I'll tell you. that the government would have said at the time, you are setting a very dangerous precedent for freedom of information doing this, and we're going to take this to judicial review. No, on the contrary. On the contrary. Well, let me speak from the exact yeah. experience that will happen. On the contrary, Jeremy Haywood, senior civil servant, said, look, the Prime Minister has set this up inquiry up. He set it up under a, a, under an act of parliament, which compels us to hand over anything that we're asked to give. And that is what we have to do. And I wasn't terribly happy about it. Tony wasn't happy, but that's what we did. And what's more, because of the nature of the discussions with the inquiry, I was reasonably confident that had I had to give far more, such as, you know, Rory got told off at school or, you know, Grace threw a tantrum or Callum, you know, told me to bugger off, whatever, that that would not in any way be deemed relevant. I would have, I would have had the trust for that. So I think the optics of this are terrible for the government, not because of a principled position on this, I think, but because actually they probably do have an awful lot that they want to hide because I suspect what she's onto here is that serious government, because we didn't have a serious prime minister, broke down. As to why it's Rishi Sunak that is pushing the hardest on this, if you were to believe some of the briefing that's going on against him, a lot of it, I suspect, from people around Boris Johnson, it may relate to some of the things that he was pushing, in particular, eat out to help out, and whether that was going against scientific advice, etc., etc., etc. So I think they've got themselves into a complete mess, and it's probably down to the way that Johnson was operating. I think that the right way to resolve this issue is what the government's doing, which is to go to judicial review and let an independent judiciary determine what's relevant, what's fair in this case or not. And I think that's an important principle. I don't think, I don't think you can in any legal situation say we're entitled to everything and we'll decide what's relevant or not. Well, I, 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 maybe that, maybe what's happened here then is that there's been a breakdown in trust in the institutions of government. I think that when, we were subject to those inquiries, even though I think by all of them, Chilcot, Butler, and there's also the Intelligence Services Committee as well that I went to, and Hutton, I think we were put through our paces very, very rigorously. And I think there was a sort of sense of, well, okay, this isn't very pleasant, but at least we sort of feel there's a kind of institution, a sense of institutional trust here. But I think what may have happened is that what we've already seen, what has already been in the public domain, gives you cause for alarm about their honesty, about their transparency. And before, and, and, and the, the other thing I, I strongly recommend, because of course it's easy to, to put this in the context of lawyers and, and so forth and process. I was just happened to be in the car the other day listening to any answers. And I strongly recommend you can go on iPlayer or whatever it's called and you go to 20 minutes, 43 seconds on this weekend just gone any answers where a woman called Philippa Bateman from Worcestershire is absolutely broken. And she tells the story of how her daughter was distressed. 
Britain. They were told by the police they couldn't go to see her because it was not deemed to be essential. The police would go to see that she was okay. The police took their time. They chased the police. Eventually, the police went, and they found that their daughter had killed herself. And this woman was in tears talking about how she couldn't go to see her daughter. They couldn't comfort her. And then only three of them could go to the funeral. And they were told by the police that on that very same day, because of various things that were going on, they also had to clear her flat. And she said she got back home and saw Boris Johnson smirking and lots of Tory MPs saying, oh, it's only a piece of cake and it's only this and it's only that. And I honestly, anybody who listens to it, and I strongly recommend people listen to it, there is no trust with this guy. There is no honesty with this guy. And even now, even now, it is all playing games. He says he's handing over all the WhatsApps, but it turns out that there was a phone that he couldn't hand over because it was taken away from him because he was a, he, it represented a security breach. And then you've got, you've got the security services, MI5, MI6, GCHQ, saying it's absolute nonsense what he's saying. It's easy to find the phone and, and to open it securely and to see what's on there. So even now, we're not getting the truth on this stuff. Well, I don't think we've got any disagreement about Boris Johnson. No, but I think that's why you're, you're, I think your assessment of what the government is trying to do, you're being, may I say, too fair. I, I guess what I'm hoping for from this inquiry, though, is something much more than pointing out that Boris Johnson's an incompetent liar. Well, of course, that's why, that's why the three modules that she set out are the right, the right approach. I think that if we look at the difference between Chilcott, Hutton and Butler, these different inquiries are very different in form. And Chilcott was a really, really good inquiry really detailed, really full, because what it got into in the end wasn't really the personalities of he said, she said, but the structural problems of the British state. So I think we had an unusually bad prime minister, but there were many problems that went well beyond Boris Johnson being terrible. And I agree. I, I, what I really want to see this inquiry do is lessons for the future. It would be terrible if the conclusion that we drew from this is Boris Johnson's a fool and therefore we'll be fine next time round because we just won't get him. Right. But that's, that's, that's absolutely, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. And I think if you read her introduction and the way she set things out and the way she's splitting it into these different investigations, that is exactly what she's going to do. But I, my, what I'm saying to you is I think you're judging the current government actions on the basis of this being a normal, rational, grown-up government, whereas in fact, I think we will find that because of the rot at the top, that the systems of government simply weren't up to it. But we'll see. But I, I just, I just feel that the approach she's taking is the right one. I think the approach the government is taking is the wrong one because I think I, I have no doubt at all this could have been resolved without going to court. I just don't believe it couldn't have been resolved. And I think that the combination of a government that's worried about what's going to emerge because of all this sort of WhatsAppery, which seems to have taken over sensible government, and Johnson playing his games, I suspect is what's driving her to be as rigorous and, and, and thorough as she is. I, I definitely think the WhatsAppery is a huge problem. And I think that's something that's changed a lot under Rishi Sunak. I mean, WhatsApp, I think, had just begun at the beginning of COVID and was completely out of control. You're totally right. They were running, it seems, when Boris Johnson was prime minister, almost everything seemed to be happening on WhatsApp. Let's see if Rishi Sunak was as grown up as everybody tells us. It does seem quite interesting that he seems so determined on this one. Alistair, I, I think if you had been in government, you would feel much more sympathetic towards the idea that there has to be a limit and that it makes sense for lawyers to determine what's relevant to an inquiry and what no, isn't. I, but, but I've, I've explained to you, I, w I was working for the government when that exactly that thing happened. And, 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 and exactly what happened, Alistair, just to put it down, is that lawyers determined what was relevant and what wasn't. You operated under the old system. You were not asked to hand over everything unredacted. Everything unredacted was seen by somebody in that Correct. process. And the same is true here. It's all well, seen well, by the it? lawyers. It's exactly the same. As, it's no, exactly it's the same as what happened with you. The difference is, is that the judge in this case is asking for something that neither Hutton, Chilcott or Butler ever asked for. Well, we're not going to agree on this. Let's just, let's just move on. Okay. So I think... One of the big issues that we should be looking at this week is US-China. We've just come out of the G7. Fumio Kishida, the Japanese prime minister, has now announced that he's going to increase defense spending to 2% of Japanese GDP. And Japan is now the third largest economy in the world. And that will mean that it will end up with the third largest military in the world. It's going to be a very, very substantial force. And this is essentially about the US trying to create 
a very, very strong coalition of which the cornerstones are Japan, South Korea, potentially the Philippines, and then other factors, Australia, Britain, and others, as a counterbalance against China. And it's getting very, very tense because you're beginning to see rhetoric coming out of the US, which sounds very much like you're with us or you're against us. And most countries in the world do not want to be forced to choose between the US and China. It's true of countries like Singapore. It's true even of India, which is playing a very complicated game in relation to the US-China relationship. In many ways, it's tending towards the US, but remember over Ukraine, it's buying oil from Russia, it's continuing to get arms from Russia. And this has become, I think, for US foreign policy, their number one driving objective. It's, it's building up with some of the same momentum that you saw the neocons building with their Middle East policy in the early 1990s. China is now presented by both Republicans and Democrats, their number one adversary. And the screws are now going on. We saw this with our Hillary Clinton interview on leading and her very dismissive references to Macron. We can see it with huge anxieties from the US over the EU. So I guess one question that, that we need to get to is is it too late for the US? Are they trying to form the sort of alliance they formed against Saddam Hussein or that they tried to form against the Soviet Union, but in a completely different situation because they're dealing with a country that is such a huge percentage of global GDP that, that it's too late to pull it off? You mentioned Singapore there. And of course, I think right now, I think it's still going on. I, I don't know if you've been in the past to the, the Shangri-La conference. I, I was at it a few years ago, and it's one of the big international defense gatherings. And yesterday, General Li Shangfu, who's the Chinese defense minister, he made a pretty significant speech. And if you were to really to sort of boil down the headline, he was essentially saying, mind your own business. And, and also was very interesting is that he was saying that he's, he's met, I think, 11 defense ministers or leaders of the defense infrastructure in 11 other countries while, whilst he's been at this Shangri-La summit. But he would turn down a request to meet Lloyd Austin, who is essentially his opposite number from the United States, which they, they apparently had a sort of brief handshake, uh, but that was pretty much about it, literally just sort of meeting in a, in a corridor. And, there's two, and, and Lloyd Austin's speech focused, as did the Canadian defense minister, their speech is focused on these kind of what they call the, the, these incursions and what they call dangerous incidents that are taking place of in the air over the South China Sea. And meanwhile, the General Shang Fu, the Chinese defense minister, he was focusing on a situation where an American ship, he says, was in a place that it shouldn't have been, and the Chinese ship cut in front of it. So that's the sort of evidence of things going very, very badly. Meanwhile, though, the director of the CIA, Bill Burns, has apparently just a month ago been in Beijing, don't know who he saw, but was there on a mission sent by Biden to try to get things onto a better footing. So I think it's very hard to read. I think on the one hand, you're right, the politics of this look to be going in one direction. But in terms of what the two governments may or may not be trying to do, I think it's, um, it's unclear. There's a, a great book that I've just been reading by Kevin Rudd, the, the former Australian prime minister, who you knew, right? And yeah. You, and he, you read he, about in your diaries. He is, a, he is something of an expert on China. And he has written this book, which is looking at US views of China and China's views of the US. And I think he's fascinated by this idea that we're getting into a Thucydides trap. And the Thucydides trap is that the Spartans felt that the Athenians were growing and they have to go to war. So there's an article in The Atlantic by Graham Allison, a Harvard professor, saying that if you look at the pattern of past great power rise, in almost every situation, it ends in war. And probably the only exception to this is when the US began to rise at the expense of the UK. And the explanation for that is that the UK may be shared enough in common with the US to not feel totally threatened by its rise. Mm. But I think what Rudd is very good at is the culture clash between these two countries, that they see each other in totally, totally different ways, that China sees the US in terms of betraying them, giving their territory to Japan after the First World War not helping them against the Japanese during the Second World War, 
playing silly games, balancing them against the Soviet Union for US interests in the 70s, and basically think that America is entirely cynical. They don't believe America's statements about democracy and human rights and free trade. They think that America is just out for its own national self-interest. Mm. Well, no, the, 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 the mutual suspicion is clearly intense. And you also have this sense that just as the Americans often would say that they can't reward the Chinese by the sort of diplomatic status that they would normally take for granted. I think now you see the Chinese doing something similar. I mean, I, I think it's pretty remarkable that, that Shang Fu says, no, I don't want to have a meeting with Lloyd Austin when they're both literally in the same hotel building um, with all this sort of stuff going and, on. And, and the US ambassador, Nick Burns in Beijing, is really struggling to get meetings. Whereas there's a, there was a huge piece in the FT at the weekend about Elon Musk and uh, Jamie Dimon, the banker, who were both in Beijing last week. As, as I think as the FT reported that the Tesla and Twitter boss had more ch top level Chinese meetings than most of the Biden administration official, officials have in recent months. Although Jake Sullivan recently met um, his opposite number. And again, it wasn't advertised. It sort of emerged after the event. So I guess it's these things that are going on at various levels. But the, I, the, the, what you were suggesting from Kevin Rudd's analysis is there's a danger you end up on a kind of automatic journey towards conflict. And I've just, just come from engagements with people who are very close to the Biden administration um, over the last three, four days. Did you get a bid in for leading with Joe? I did not manage to get a bid for Joe. Okay. Well, we, I'll, I'll keep plugging away on that one. Keep plugging away. You'll probably get do that. But what was... I think really, you know, I, I gently suggested that uh, America's position in the world is more tricky than it was in the 1990s. Yeah. And I cannot tell you what an incredibly visceral reaction I got from these senior Americans, how much they wanted to say, that's bullshit. Everybody prefers American values. Look at our friends in Asia. They're with us. They're against China. And then very much got on to being brutal on Europe saying, you know, Macron's got to step up, Schultz has got to step up, the EU's better decide which side they're on. And they were getting into the details of what exactly Macron had said in his Politico interview, where he'd seemed to be uh, pretty ambivalent about defending Taiwan. I mean, I, so I do feel that somewhere within Biden, Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, and indeed the broader Washington world, is a very, very, very strong sense that they now have to build a whole coalition against China. Mm. And it's a very difficult time to do it because in many ways, obviously Europe is distracted, deeply involved in the whole question of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. the, I, I, the other thing I, I noticed this week was was a, a report on US-China trade. And it, it said that the Ch Ch China is going to account for less than half of America's low cost imports from Asia. This companies are going to other places like, I know, Vietnam, Indonesia. And, and that's that's reduced from... That's Way a significant over half. Reduction. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a, there's a there's a graph that shows Mexico on the rise and, and as a share of U.S. goods imports and China, you know, quite a significant fall. Which I guess is I don't know is related to the politics. I guess. And yet, when he was at um, the G7 in Hiroshima, the the one thing that Biden did say he said he was expecting an imminent thaw in relations. Now, whether that was just because he wanted. To, say that, or whether he was hoping that the, the, the Bill Burns trip, which by then had happened, was going to lead somewhere. But I have to say, if you read um, General Shang Fu's speech in Singapore, then there wasn't much sign of it. I don't think there's much thought. I think two, two, two final things. It, within the EU, there seems to have been this move from talking about decoupling from the Chinese economy to realizing they can't do that because 50% of the Profits of European automobile and luxury goods manufacturers are made in China. Yeah. Towards now talking about de-risking instead of decoupling, that they're yeah. just too integrated into the Chinese economy to imagine decoupling. Yeah. And then within Britain, we have this very weird thing happening within the Conservative Party, which is you've got Liz Truss flying to Taiwan, making these incredibly aggressive speeches, saying, you know, even if we have to give up on Chinese cooperation on climate, we've got to accept that, you know, we have to confront China. Ian Duncan Smith attacking Rishi Sunak for not being critical enough of China and the national security strategy. And I guess a, a, a real difficulty for any government in Britain, which is Britain's economy is not in great shape. Trade with China is going to be increasingly important. 
and working out how you position yourself to China is going to be really important for Britain's economy. Mm. I wonder if um, Rishi Sunak tried to stop Liz Truss making that visit. Looking at um, Bill Burns' previous special missions on behalf of Biden, it's not the most encouraging track record if we think that he's there trying to get better relations with Beijing because he was the guy, if you remember, who was sent to Moscow in conditions of secrecy to try to persuade them, Russian officials against invading Ukraine. And then the other job he had was to try and persuade Nancy Pelosi not to go to Taiwan. So, um, well, so fi- final thing just before we go to the break then. So I think my sort of summary of this is that the US, as it tries to make allies, is in a difficult position. I think a lot of Africa now is not going to come down on the US side against China. I think the Middle East, Saudi in particular, is signaling a much warmer relationship with China. Latin America, most of the more leftist governments in Latin America are likely to be more on the Chinese side. And in any case, China owns $200 billion worth of Latin American debt at the moment. And with the rest of Asia, I think it's far from clear that people want to be forced to choose. So I think the US may find this a very, very difficult coalition to sustain. Mm. Okay, well, let's take a break. Welcome back to the Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And you've just done a brilliant interview on leading, which anybody can search typing Mary McAleese leading into, into your podcast. Tell us a bit about that interview. Well, she was, she was absolutely wonderful. And there's a, there's a lot of love for her in some of the responses we've had. I mean, I knew a bit about her, but I didn't quite know that her life story was so kind of dramatic. I mean, I knew that she was a, a Catholic growing up in a Protestant area in the Ardoin in Northern Ireland. I knew that she had personal experience of the troubles. But when she told the story of the, the, the attacks on her house and this terrible bombing that reduced her father literally to years of catatonic depression in which he didn't even speak. And then, and yet she's just got this humor and vivacity and, but to go from that to become Irish president, you know, from a, from dirt poverty, I mean, the sound of her, her childhood was really quite extraordinary. Very funny stuff about her, her grandfather who refused to have electricity. He just, he said this electricity thing is never going to catch on. And her first, <laughs> her first official opening was when she went down <laughs> to, to have to switch on his only, his only light bulb that he finally agreed agreed to have. But also, you know, to maybe to bring it up to to modern times, to today, I mean, honestly, she was she talked about what Johnson the damage Johnson and Truss have done to Britain standing, but also Brexit. She describes Brexit as a flesh eating disease. It was, anyway, I strongly recommend People listen to it uh, really, really. And, and actually, we might have a back and do it together at one point because I think she's just absolutely brilliant. And on the Brexit thing, let's just briefly talk about Labour. And Keir Starmer had an article last week in the Daily Express. And listen, I've got no problem with writing in the Daily Express, just as we had, you know, we got criticised for travelling around the world to see Murdoch, etc. But it was a piece about Brexit, and... I just felt it was it was almost on a par with the Brexiteers who say we've just got to believe in this more. He's still talking about making Brexit work. He's going through the things, the areas where Brexit is not working. But I do, I just don't understand the politics of this right now. I'm afraid the mood on Brexit is moving to a very different place. I believe, and so he's obviously thinking, well, I've got to keep these people happy who voted for Brexit. I'm not going to tell them they're stupid. I'm going to tell them that we did the, they did the right thing. I understand why they did it. But it's doing so much damage to the country at the moment. I don't understand why he's in that position. Can we just sort of get into this? Because it is the sort of $60,000 question, isn't it? You are increasingly convinced that if Labour came out clearly and said, we're in favour of, I don't know, single market customs union Brexit actually they'd be fine. They'd still win the election. That wouldn't loosen the election. That'd be a good thing to do. I don't even think they need to go that far. I don't think they need to go that far because that does bring you back to free movement and all that sort of stuff. I just think saying in a very clear way, it's not working. It's going badly. We're not reversing it, but we have to revisit 
the arrangements. I think that's all he needs to say. And he sort of said that, but it was in a sort of hidden in all this kind of, you know, there's no question of this and there's no question of that. And I understand why you voted for it and all this sort of stuff. And I just think it's in the wrong place. Is he not going to, presumably he's going to lose quite a lot of people who were passionate about the European Union and were hoping that he was going to change the Tory Brexit policy. Well, I think, look, I, I've had, I had people, including somebody that I persuaded to join the Labour Party not long ago, who sent me a message saying, look, I've, I've left. Uh, right. because I can't see, I can't see, and it's not even the fact of seeing Brexit, wanting to see Brexit fixed, which I think is the line to, rather than make Brexit work, I think you should be saying we're going to fix this Brexit deal. I think it's also this sense of the the positioning all being about the kind of leaning into the right as opposed to what the Labour Party really, really stands for. And I also, I have a little bit of a concern. I know you were interested in this situation up in the Northeast with the Jamie Driscoll, who's the, the mayor up in the North, Metro mayor up in the Northeast. And, and just, just to explain to listeners, Jamie Driscoll, Metro mayor, but the local Labour Party has decided he cannot stand in the forthcoming bigger mayoral elections. And this is something that's caused real ructions, including Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Manchester writing in and defence. And Steve Rotherham, Liverpool. Steve Rotherham, Liverpool. And also actually the um, one of Liz Truss's big allies, Simon Clark, saying he found him a really good mayor who had the interest of the region at his heart, who wasn't particularly political or ideological. And he thought, so he's got conservative defenders too. It's a very strange, I mean, he's been a popular bipartisan figure. Well, I think that what's going on here is that one of the things that the, the Labour Party under Keir Starmer is determined to show is that it's moved on from the Corbyn era, rooting out anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So far as I can work out, the, the sin that has been committed has been to share a platform with Ken Loach, the film director. Now, Ken, Ro- Ken Loach is, you know, he's, he's a brilliant filmmaker. Uh, he's he, including he's made some brilliant films set up in the Northeast, which I think was one of the reasons why they did this event together. Yeah. But he does have something of a track record on the whole, pro you know, zealously pro Corbyn, anti Semitism, yeah. etc. All that, all that space. But I think it's it, it, the fact of sharing a platform with somebody, unless Jamie Driscoll has himself said or done something. I think it's bizarre. I mean, it's one thing sharing a platform with you know, somebody who's themselves a terrorist, but sharing a platform with a film director who has, I mean, you know, you're, you're then going to get in a very, very weird world. Ken Loach was a big endorser of my Iraq book. You, you will be not very astonished to hear. So he's all over my book. <laughs> well, I'm, so sure I'm, that, a, I'm a big, big fan of Ken Loach as a result. I'm sure that Ken Loach um, would be, you know, would, would, would see me in, as being in the sort of war criminal category. But I see Ken Loach as somebody who is, a brilliant filmmaker who has a lot to say about the state of the world, whose views of politics and a lot of what's gone on in the Labour Party in recent years, I profoundly disagree with. But I would happily share a platform with Ken Loach. Yeah, exactly. I, and, and, I, and I wouldn't be expect to be expelled from the Labour Party, of which I, I'm yeah. not currently a member. But <laughs> where which I you remember, were expelled. <laughs> I, I would not expect to be expelled just for, you know, if we were, let's say we were to get him here on leading, I mean, does that, I don't know, where do you draw the line on this sort of stuff? Well, no, we, we got Jerry Adams on leading. Well, and, and, and as you know, Rory, I had met Jerry Adams many <laughs> dozens of times prior to that, including when there was a vague suspicion that he might have been involved in terrorism, you know. Can they reverse this decision? Is it too late? Uh, I don't know what the processes are, um, but it does seem a bit odd. It, it's very interesting that he's had such a, because Andy Burnham's not from the Corbyn left. And as I say, conservative MPs in the area also rate him. So it seems a very, mm. very unfair yeah. thing. I don't know him well, um, but I mean, look, I think he's definitely on the sort of Corbyn Easter wing yeah. of the Labour Party. And, and, I, and I, I know there's sort of, you know, the, the kind of people like John McDonnell have been out defending him, which is fine. And he, he's been going on picket lines. He thinks he may be in trouble because he appeared on a picket line. But again, that's a bit weird to, well, to start not allowing a Labour mayor to appear on a picket line. Seems yeah, a and also, mad. if we're going, if we're serious about devolution, we're going to have different characters and different people. So, no, I think on, uh, as you know, Rory, I'm not, I, I, I desperately want Keir Starmer to win. I really want Labour to, to, to win the next election. But these, the, this was two things in a week that, that I was not terribly 
impressed by. Well, I'd like to pay tribute to you for being non-tribal and, and unlike you, unlike the, you on the COVID unlike inquiry. my massive tribal defence of the government's position on the COVID <laughs> inquiry. <laughs> now, should we go to another? Should we go to another place that that, yep. that I'm deeply concerned about? In which I think you, we can see the two of us. Um, you playing the role of Alexander Vukic and me playing the role of Albin Korti. <laughs> so we've come, so here we are in in Kosovo. And this is actually something we covered in quite a lot of detail, actually, I think, thanks to you. You made us do this a few few months ago. Yeah. And we talked through the fact that we thought there were very, very serious risks um, in Northern Kosovo. And indeed, they have been revealed in very dramatic form. Mm. And this goes to big, big questions of peace, of Serbia's continuing relationships with Russia, of whether or not these countries can join the European Union and whether by joining the European Union you might be able to resolve some of these tensions. But the immediate tension at this moment is that the majority of the population in these particular districts in northern Kosovo are ethnic Serbians rather than ethnic Albanians. They boycotted the local elections and people with a few hundred votes who were voted for only by the minority Albanians were then imposed as mayors. And this has then caused this violence and NATO's had to deploy troops. And the general sense, I think, which we talked about a few months ago is that Albin Kurti- The prime minister. The yeah, prime minister of, of, um, of Kosovo is somebody who was welcomed because he was seen as less corrupt, more idealistic, cleaner than his predecessor, but has turned out, unfortunately, along with that idealism to be very, very unbending and quite absolutist. And this pushing to get these mayors installed seems to have been a very, very provocative, unwise, mm. daft well, act. Well, that, that, that is a view that the Americans have expressed. Uh, it's a view that the European Union has expressed. And also my friend Eddie Rama, I don't know if you saw, he did a long interview on the BBC about this the other day. And he was, he was saying actually that this is not as serious as it looks, provided that both Kosovo and Serbia get back to the deal that they did back in, I think it was March, where essentially, and, and this was quite a big, this was quite a big breakthrough, I think, when uh, Josep Borrell, the European foreign policy chief, he, he, he spent 12 hours in talks between Vukic, the president, um, who looks nothing like me, by the way. Uh, and <laughs> he, he was, however, he was, however, previously a minister of information. That's, that's why true. I was drawing the, ta the taste of this comparison. Yeah. And, but, but he's, and he's also very tall. He's one of the few world leaders who's significantly taller than I am. So he, he and, um, and, uh, Kurti, the Kosovo prime minister were in these talks. And essentially they came out and Kosovo had agreed to set up something which the, uh, Serb majority in these northern districts had been asking for, which is an association of Serb majority munis municipalities. And Serbia had said it would, quote, not object. It wasn't exactly say it was support. It would not object to Kosovo's membership of an international organization. Of course, Kosovo's dream is to be proper, properly recognized at the United Nations. They've currently on 99 countries that reckon, uh, out of the 193 that recognize them. That includes us, it includes the US, it includes 22 out of the European Union countries, Cyprus, Greece, Romania, Slovakia, and Spain are the ones who continue not to recognize them. So that was where it was heading. And, and, and also, sorry, just, just to add to that, there was also this vote, April, which brought um, Kosovo into the Council of Europe, yeah. which was another bit, big bit of progress. Big step, so, yeah. And then, but then, so then with these elections, so the, Serb, the reason for the Serb boycott was they felt that there had been not enough progress made on promises already made about giving them some sort of, I, I mean, it's not devolved power, but some sort of authority that they could say, we're being treated as a bit special. So they were protesting at that. And then when the elections happened, and as you say, the turnout was less than 4%, because although if you look at Kosovo as a whole, 1.8 million people, 92% are Albanian, and yep. only 6% six, only 6 are Serb, but a lot of that 6%, they do live up in this northern patch. And so they didn't take part, and you then literally did have sort of dozens of police officers who were escorting these four mayors, one of whom had had literally, I think it was in, you know, fewer than 100 votes. And that kicked off. There was then violence. Kurti is insistent that some of that violence is from 
criminal gangs. Some of it is being provoked by uh, and, and endorsed and supported by Russia. Yeah. And of course, the bigger picture here is about, this is why the Americans and the Europeans are so involved in this. The bigger picture is how to prevent Serbia from being too locked into the kind of Russian orbit. And, and, and on that, Vucic has been quite smart. I mean, people were very worried because he'd been associated with Milosevic in the past and was seen as a Serbian nationalist, that he would be drawn into Russia's orbit completely. But he's been quite canny on that. He has retained good relations with Russia. And I was talking to a Russian yesterday whose family's moved to Serbia because it's one of the few places that they can go without visas. Yeah. But he's also kept sufficient distance, not really to become a kind of Putin tool. And one of the things when he uh, began making these agreements with the EU and Kosovo, he then faced protests from the far right of people wearing sort of pro-Putin t-shirts and symbols. Mm. Mm. So it's a sort of reminder with all these politicians that often, you know, when they try to take a moderate course, they end up with extremists on their own side. Yeah. But the Americans, the Americans have been pretty firm on this. They, they actually with, withdrew the right of Kosovo to take part in a military exercise that was being planned. And then, of course, you have this Novak Djokovic. You know who Novak Djokovic is, Rory? He's a tennis player. <laughs> tennis player. He inserted himself rather unhelpfully at the Paris, the French Open in Paris. You know, they have this thing of getting marker pens and they sign their signature on a camera as they finish a match. And he went on and scribbled, Kosovo is the heart of Serbia, um, <laughs> which of course is, it was, uh, you know, not the, not the most helpful thing that he, that he could have done. And just to go back to our previous discussion, to remind people that one of the, the big things that, was, that triggers all this is the refusal of Serbs living in that area to use some of them, not all of them, to use a Kosovan number plates. They, they have yep. Serb plates on their cars. Yep. But anyway, bottom line is tense, difficult, terrible that soldiers got and police officers got injured, some of them very seriously. 700 more troops have had to be sent there. But there is still a deal to be done and that we should focus on that. March the 17th in North, North Macedonia, both sides should go back to that. Which I think brings us on to the final thing, which is Poland. So big demonstrations in Poland. And there, just to remind people, the Law and Justice Party came in and has been ruling in a very, very unpleasant populist nationalist style. Poland being obviously the sort of mirror image of Hungary, of what Viktor Orban's doing in, in Hungary. A government, people want to read more about it. There's a great book by Anne Applebaum called Twilight of Democracy. She's married to a Polish politician, but she talks about the domination of incredible conspiracy theories, the fact that the government's state-owned media, it's sort of BBC equivalent, whipped up so much mad hatred against the mayor of Gdansk that he was actually eventually stabbed to death on stage mm. um, with no apologies from the government. Deep fights with, with the European Union because they've been refusing to accept the judges which are proposed mm. by Parliament or by the Judicial Commission, stuffing their own people into the judiciary as well as state media. Yeah. So big test, I guess, for rule of law in Europe, the standards of the European Union against mm. Poland, and now these these protests. Over to you. Well, half a million people is what the mayor of uh, Warsaw was was putting it at, and of course, and two of the the big names who were there. One was Lech, Lech Valenza, who of course was yep. the leader of the Solidar Solidarity Movement in the eighties, became president, and the other was Donald Tusk, who well known to us through the Brexit debate with his role at the European Union, um, but he's now the leader of the of the main opposition party, the Civic Platform, and the tipping point that seems to have taken this into. Uh, a different level, really, is this new law that they brought in. The, it's called the Anti-Russia Commission, which is going to have the power to ban people from public office who it is deemed to have been too helpful to the Russians in the past. And it's, it's been called Lex, the, the law has been called Lex Tusk, Tusk law, because it, essentially people think this is a sort of backdoor, well, pretty front door way to stop him from competing to, to d disqualify Tusk from running in elections. Yeah, yeah, they'll say basically he he allowed he allowed Poland to become too dependent well, we on Russia. We see this more and more, don't we? Because of course this is the other one stuff, disqualifying popular candidates from running in elections. And I think it's something that we don't talk about enough when we talk about the laws around democracy. We often talk about free and fair elections, but I think really holding to the principle which I think we've got in Britain, which is that anyone can run for election. Mm. And that we don't get into the business of governments deciding who or 
who are not suitable candidates. I mean, we do end up with some rogues, but... Yeah, we, we certainly do. We should, we should maybe end on this because there's another situation. In fact, we had a couple of questions about it. In Senegal, where exactly this is happening right now, the, the social media and messaging platforms have been blocked. Uh, there's been violence and unrest, and it's all because the opposition leader, Usmane Sonko, has been sentenced for two years for immoral behavior. And the, the people are essentially are saying that this is simply a kind of, you know, fake thing to prevent him from contesting the election. Well, and famously in Malaysia, the most impressive Malaysian politician was put in jail for accused of sodomy. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very, very disturbing. And I think this whole theme that we're talking about with this new world order and whether the American world order is going to be able to survive and whether the Chinese world order is challenging it is partly about doesn't matter whether we're talking about Malaysia or Senegal or Poland, those three continents, this erosion of democracy that we're seeing and the erosion yeah. of civil society and, and the pattern of the way that they're learning from each other. So one of the things that's very striking in Applebaum's book is you can see American Republican think tanks turning up in Hungary and in Poland. And then the same think tanks who are putting Maloney on stage then end up involved in this national conservatism conference in London. Mm. And there's a sort of playbook, which Steve Bannon used to be very, very explicit about, and, and which will become much, much worse with two things. If, if Trump gets back in the States, and if Le Pen wins the French presidency, mm. we're going to see a much, much worse version of this. Absolutely. And by the way, I have to thank your constant plugging of Al Jazeera. I didn't know about this Senegal situation until I was watching Al Jazeera. As of the last, last night when I was watching it, 15 people have been killed in the violence. Can I, speaking of plugging, remind people that, but what can I do, is currently out and selling. <laughs> um, but take, take, take opportunity from that to plug the fact that I will be launching my book if anybody would like to come. Before you go, before you go on, before yeah. you go on, yes. it's called Politics on the Edge. That's oh, beautiful. I love the way you do that. It's like, it's beautiful. Um, so 2nd and 3rd September in Manchester and London, if anybody would like to come along. And uh, details on the website is something called Fane, F-A-N-E. Is it, what is it, Old Trafford and Wembley? Uh, it's, uh, I wish Old Trafford and Wembley. <laughs> it's called the Lowry in Manchester and the Barbican in Barbican. In oh, Lowry. that's pretty cool. The Lowry's cool. And the Barbican's Lowry's quite cool. cool. Yeah, 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 kind yeah. Of music, music venue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's all right. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alistair. Beautiful shirt. Very envious of it. Thank you. And uh, look forward to speaking soon. <laughs>